Welcome to Barley Me Presents Leonard Malting, our beer-centric movie podcast offshoot of my regular Barley Me podcast. I'm your host, Ben Rice. With me, as always, my co-host for Leonard Malting from Sacramento Pink Boot Society, Paulina Olivares. Hola. And from the Dare Daniel podcast, a bad movie podcast about town, it's Corky McDonald. Hello, hello, everybody. And today, we're going to be reviewing and talking about the movie Beer, A Love Story. And there's a twist. It's not just us talking. We have the director of the film, photographer of the film, writer of the film, Friedrich Moser, a.k.a. Fritz. Fritz, how you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Since this is a beer podcast, I think we should get this out of the way right now. Your movie is a love story to beer. And so, and it brought up a lot of feelings for me that we'll get into, but we decided we would drink beers that we love or because of the fact that uh the first shot is of a goose uh one of me and paulina's favorite styles uh maybe a goose or a lambic or something like that so we all got something we love to watch or talk about this movie with uh so for me i've got a uh black butte 26th anniversary from deschutes bourbon barrel aged porter 26th anniversary um made with a cacao nibs and cranberry and pomegranate molasses so it's a bunch of stuff going on there. It's like five or six years old. So I'm looking forward to that because Black Butte Porter, one of my favorite beers. Uh, Paulina, what do you got? I have Allagash's I Believe in Love, uh, <laughs> which I thought was appropriate because it's a love story to beer. Uh, sour Ale, aged on raspberries and cranberries, um, which is delicious, very tart. Um, but it's not necessarily breakfast beer because I just kind of brush my teeth. Not <laughs> 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 but it is very tasty. I love Allagash, like everything they do. I love like the Belgian style beers they mm-hmm. do. They're, they're awesome. Yeah. And Corky, what do you got over there? Uh, we'll see now it's 9 a.m. on a Sunday and I've been awake for 15 minutes. I'm drinking uh, Treehouse Coffee Company's Peru Estrella Divina. Uh, it's a brewery that's also dabbling in some coffee roasting. But in keeping with the sour theme, I brewed this yesterday and just reheated it. So it's got that nice sour bitterness. <laughs> <laughs> and Fritz, last but not least, what are you drinking for this episode? So I've got here uh, from my favorite Austrian brewer, who is also featured in the film, protagonist of the film, Chris Bichler from uh, the Birol Brewery in, in Tyrol in the Alps. I've got a Gipfe, which means mountaintop. And it's a farmhouse saison uh, uh, that I've got. Uh, I would love to have an Allagash, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's a little bit harder to get it over here. I'll have to and, send them um, to you. <laughs> yeah, that, that, this would be lovely. Yeah, but for me, it's not early in the morning. For me, it's actually uh, the closing of the day. So it's uh, <laughs> rather just around 6 p.m. over here in Vienna, Austria. Yeah, so we're going to have some very different energy levels. I'm very excited about it. Uh, I think the easiest question here, uh, Fritz, you're not known for a lighthearted romp of a film that's a journey through your love of beer. You kind of do a little bit more in-depth intellectual treatises upon um, the the general way that we process information. Is that an accurate way to depict what you typically do? So the kind of documentaries that I'm using, that, that I usually do, since 2009, 2010, I'm, I kind of ended up doing mostly political films. So, uh, but not political about political parties or so, but about, uh, you know, the kind of systems, um, that are driving our world. Um, one was about lobbying in Brussels. It was the first film about lobbying in Brussels. The film that I'm currently working on is uh, accompanying, uh, several, teams of IT engineers in building a truth engine. So basically uh, building an AI tool to speed up fact-checking to real time. And, and also some journalists working with technology like the New York Times visual investigations team. And so uh, that's the kind of stuff that I'm, I also did a film about the NSA, um, basically a program that uh, was developed internally at NSA that very likely would have prevented 9-11 from happening. And it's a it's an undertold story, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a big investigation by the Pentagon into that. And um, I met a guy who had read this Pentagon report on that um, um, on that story. And, and uh, he is currently or has been fighting to, to get it declassified for the past like five years or so. 
And so it's really, um, yeah, I did something about the automation of the uh, financial markets and how that came into play. And it actually started in the casinos of Las Vegas oh. uh, with people trying to find algorithms with, with which they could actually beat the the house, the bank, um, <laughs> on the on the roulette and on blackjack. So this was like the beginning of the algorithms that then went into the automated trading systems that are currently kind of. I think I think it's also underreported as a story. And uh, something that I like is doing like, on the one hand, kind of trying to paint a bigger picture, and connecting dots between things we seem to know but where the connections are not that obvious and on the other hand i try to approach my subjects or, or my topics through human stories and i think the human story side totally can be seen in my film about craft beer but i mean what i have to say is um, the craft beer film landed uh you know on my plate so to say <laughs> or in my class um on a Sunday afternoon at the Documentary Film Festival in Sheffield, UK, when I was meeting with a friend of mine from Brussels, Martin, and uh, we started a conversation about a project that we wanted to work together and ended up actually doing a project together, which was this film about beer. And so this was, uh, that's, that's, that's the way how films come to me, actually. So I'm not really doing, I'm not researching topics, I'm not researching stories, but I happen to stumble over stories and I happen to stumble over topics. And in that case, it was like, what's the equivalent of Mondo Vino for the beer world? Okay. And, 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 and we didn't know, frankly. So we said, <laughs> okay, that's something that we should give a shot. Uh, yeah. And, and try. so basically you're saying that when you're going to film a documentary, you go in with the basic idea of it. You're like, who do I talk to to learn more? And then, by the way, let's film that so that way we can draw the story out <laughs> instead of going in there thinking you know what you're talking about. Uh, yes, but I think, you know, it, at the beginning of, of any project, there is research that you need to do. So you don't start with the camera rolling. Uh, you have you need to have a clear idea what this is going to be about. and then And then the first step is actually investigating what kind of stories are there in this realm that uh, could be attractive for viewers who have no clue mm -hmm. about this very particular, you know, subject matter, but who we could kind of give a guided tour into that world, yeah? and be it uh, the automation of the financial system, be it, uh, you know, developing surveillance system uh, systems, be it um, brewing craft beer, you know? Yeah. So what we had to do, so once, once Martin and I, and this was, I think, after, after a week or so went back from that, uh, uh, when, when, when back from Sheffield, uh, after a week of research, we had seen there was no film about beer that could claim to be the film about beer. So there were many films about craft beers, about craft beer, especially in America, but most of them about either individual brewers or about individual beer styles. The same also in Europe, uh, in Germany, you have uh, several films about Franconia and, and their brewing tradition, uh, which is great. You know, that's like the place where they have the highest density of, of breweries in Europe. But also there, um, the aspect of what the new world brought to the old world in terms of, you know, a, a revival of brewing culture is totally missing if you just take this one very specific look. And so... Something that we wanted to achieve with our film was combining uh, European traditions uh, with with um, the the innovation that has come from America to the beer sector, and also the rising quality levels and the expansion in flavors and in tastes and in um, you know treating beer in a much more experimental way. And so, so, so this was something that we wanted, that we really set out at the very beginning. And then the question was, how can you actually tell this story? If you think that there are certainly over a hundred beer styles, there are several thousand breweries, like, I don't know, 20,000 breweries worldwide mm -hmm. or something like this. And then, uh, you have, 
yeah, and then you have all all the different countries. And so what we decided uh, would be the way to to work us through this was to find characters. So in film, we call them characters, but basically yeah. it's people who um, can guide us into that universe and discover some angles of that. And uh, we knew that also because the financing came from Austria and from Belgium, uh, we knew that at least some of our protagonists would need to be Austrians and Belgians. And then there was this lucky coincidence that my my Austrian brewer, Chris, actually got inspired in America to become a brewer. Uh, his kind of, uh, how to say, his epiphany was a dogfish head 60-minute IPA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my my awakening to craft beer was a, um, a Port City, I think a... Um, a triple IPA, so oh, uh, and, 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 and imperial IPA. That's a bad and I had never, fire. And I, I mean, and I remember really, I don't know the exact date, but it must have been like the end of April in 2014 when we were filming uh, in Washington, D.C. And and we had wrapped a little bit earlier and, and uh, I was meeting with a friend of mine from Austria who lived there, you know, to have a chat. And uh, because we were filming close to the Pont Circle and because he... He also was working somewhere near. We agreed, okay, let's go to Grainer's Bookshop at, at the Pont Circle. And um, they have a bar down. So they have the bookstore, the bookstore but downstairs they've got this uh, cafe and, and bar and, and have something to drink there. And because I always wanted to consume regionally, you know, like regional food, but also regional drinks. And, mm-hmm. and, and you know, in beer countries, it's beer. And in wine countries, it's wines. I I asked him what what do you you know suggest and this is what he suggested and it totally blew my mind. I had never had any <laughs> beer like that before that. Yeah. And although I had had you know I had pale ales when I was in England, I had of course Austria and Germany is like Weizen and Bock and and Lagerland largely, so there's not a, a huge variety of tastes. Um, and I had um, lived in Belgium for some months, so. I was acquainted to the Belgian doubles and triples, mm-hmm. but um, for me, you know, having this Imperial IPA was something that that was a mind blowing experience in the sense that I couldn't get this taste. I, I didn't drink much because we had to drive out outside of DC where we were staying, but uh, the taste itself, the flavors stuck in my mind for like four or five days. And, and, and I think, you know, if this is, so <laughs> after, after going back to Vienna, after that shoot in America, um, I was like desperate. And I said, <laughs> I mean, how, where, where on earth can I find in Austria a beer that has th- those kind of flavors and is so rich and, 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 you know, also powerful and mighty. Also, I mean, it's a, it's an imperial IPA, so it has good body and everything. And so I, my wife actually, Stephanie, so she found out that um, at a at a store nearby, uh, which was selling like uh, specialty whiskies and specialty coffees and specialty cocoa beans and this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. uh, they had a sign out there out there saying now also new uh, now also craft beer available here, and uh, and so I went there. And, and asked them uh, if they had something similar to what I had experienced in America. And they said, no, we don't have foreign craft beers, but we have like from these emerging region, like, you know, newly founded breweries, uh, we've, we've got some beers from, from them. And they gave me three bottles to, you know, try. And um, among them was the Mountain Pale Ale, okay. which actually is sort of an, yeah, it's actually an IPA, I'd say. Yeah, the Mountain Pale like Ale by, by Chris Bichler and his brewery Birol. And so I tasted them and this was exactly what I had loved so much in America. So I, I hooked up with him and said, you know, I'm going, I'm traveling uh, Vienna, Innsbruck. So that's like the range. Uh, that's like the same way like uh, New York to DC, you know, um, every second weekend um, for family matters. 
And uh, I could make a stopover. This would just be like a, sh a brief deviation of 10 minutes uh, to, to visit you in your brewery. And uh, you give me something, you show me what you have. And he said, yeah, okay, stop by. And so this is how, how we met. And then, and this was years, years before I even had a thought about <laughs> making a film about beer because I thought there must have been films about beer because especially in the US, it was so uh, popular craft beer. Yeah. It and turns out I, I think, you know, if, if you're living in, in California, you're really living in a, in like, in, in, a, in a blessed environment for that. Um, because these are the places where craft beer started in the US. But in Austria, craft beer in total has a market share, which is under, which is beneath 1% market share. So it's mm -hmm. really, that's like, you know, um, that's like really hard to get. And, and now it's, it has gotten a lot better in the past years. But back then in 2014, this was just beginning. Yeah. And the fun fact was that uh, this beer, the Mountain Pale Ale, had just won the audience award uh, at the at the first Vienna Craft Beer Festival. Yeah, which is captured in the film. Yeah. Which is mentioned. captured in the film. Yeah. 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 I, I really like you mentioned uh, talking about like the old school beers to the new school beers, like old world, new world. And I think you demonstrate that the first beer we see is a goose and the second beer we see is a hazy IPA. So it's like, oh, that's the beginning. And then we're right to the present. You kind of get that uh, locked in immediately. You know, uh, we all watched this movie and like then we talked about it. And one thing we came away with was, man, we need to drink more lambics. Like <laughs> we need yeah. more gooses. Like Absolutely. we need to get back to our sours. Like that. If there's any love story for the Barley and Me Presents <laughs> Bunnard Malden crew, it's loving those beers that, you know, in America, they're not really commonly made. They're a lot of time. They're a lot of money. Uh, you know, a Lambix two or three years, then you get a Guza, which is like a, uh, or sorry, a Goose. What's wrong with me? I know what I'm talking about. You get a, <laughs> you get a Goose, and that's like take blend three of those and let them sit for another year or two. And there's no brewery that's got the, got the space, the time, the money, and the will to to do that. So they're very exciting to come across. And when you see one that's made in the U.S., it's like incredible to see. Yeah, I mean, for me actually, my personal takeaway was while while doing the film, it was really the discovery of the Lambix. Which I, I might have known before, but for me, you know, like a cherry beer. Are you serious? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and that, um, but also because I'm not so much on the sweet side, uh, but more on the sour and bitter side. Um, I, I totally fell in love with that, really. And I think, you know, also seeing, you know, being there at the, at this Zen River, uh, with, with, um, Frank Boone. From the from from the boom brewery, you know, and the river is flowing right through the the area of the of of, of his brewery. So between uh, the the brew house and the and the fermentation halls, so he hasn't got uh, cellars, but he is he is uh, the fermentation is happening in halls, and uh, where he has got all these huge old fooders, and then realizing that basically the natural yeast that's there in this microclimate starts the entire fermentation process mm -hmm. and and having this like sort of spontaneous fermentation that is that that's on that's being started there and has been started there since hundreds of years that's that's amazing and i i think you know another another sour beer experience for me that was kind of really impressive was being at so there is uh, the, the Stiegel Brewery in Salzburg, Austria. Mm -hmm. They are like the biggest privately owned brewery in Austria. Uh, so much of the Austrian breweries are owned by Heineken, but they are but they are privately owned still and run. And they are of the size of, I would say, New Belgium. Okay, more 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 or less, in terms of you know output and and um, they have they have these uh, kind of exp more experimental. A uh, small craft brewery on the side, some like half an hour, yeah, 20 minutes, half an hour out of Salzburg, uh, in Wilshut. And there they are brewing a, their, their so-called Uwe beer, like primordial beer, um, brewed after a recipe that's 4,000 years old. Oh, that's, and from that's also, that's unbelievable. You know, if you think about it. So this was their, so this recipe of this beer was there before the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans. 
before we had even, you know, writing or culture in Europe. So that's, 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 this is how far back the brewing culture goes. And, and, and you, and the, I mean, the fact that you can replicate that is amazing. Yeah, I um, I thought it was really interesting when you had Stiegel. In America, they're mostly known for their Rattlers. So yeah. when they were having that beer underground, I was like, I didn't even know they have all these other things they do because the beers that we get that they're really popular for is just like the fruited, you know, they're 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 half beer basically. They're not, you know, yeah. full beer. So I was like, that's really cool. Yeah, uh, Corky, yeah. would would you drink that herb beer when you were looking at it? Were you like, that's what I want? in my mouth yeah <laughs> just seeing the way it was done in the uh in the amphidays and and the just the shot capturing it coming from the ground up looking into them as if you're getting the viewpoint of that process that whole deep in the ground buried process i love the way the film kind of married that old world uh historical four thousand year old traditional brewing with these new modern elements and the new technologies taking advantage you got from there you go into a laboratory and you're watching people hold beakers of it up and it, it's just a great dichotomy it's it also captured the dichotomy of how disparate these locations are and yet the interconnectedness of the modern world is bringing you you follow that audience protagonist chris as he ventures to all these disparate locations yeah. it's really really evocative yeah, I I actually was I I think we were really fortunate that this story played out like that, but also but also the other stories. You know, we were um, when we started with the film. For me, Chris was the go-to guy once I discovered that he had actually asked him oh, how how actually did you become a brewer, and he said, you know, I actually come from gastronomy. So he he's a he's a trained chef, and uh, and he made a kind of internship in the U.S. Uh, for a year and this is where when he had his awakening experience his his epiphany of craft beer um in in florida and he then yeah so i think he he was doing his internship in a country club in florida and uh but then uh he went up to ohio yeah to ohio and uh and uh, uh to several cities up there uh close close to the to the lakes to mm-hmm. the great yeah. lakes and uh and 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 this is where he then really started to embrace all this, the lo- the the more local neighborhood character of craft beer in America, and this was the thing. This I think this was the biggest takeaway for him when he came back, to to, to try to do something similar, in 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 the mountains in Austria, and um, what also is, and then the other person that was uh, pretty early on committed to the film was Julia Hertz. Okay. Um, yeah. Because how produced it, I believe. A, a story, a story that, that we wanted to feature was actually um, we, the, the Wicked Weed story. Oh. But then uh, Wicked course. Weed was not, um, they didn't reply to be in the film. But and I love to qualify at this point <laughs> for the film if you're going to talk about uh, it. I think, beer. you know, this is, the Wicked Weed story is actually the kind of, it's a, a mindset, I think, more of a, like a beer startup, you yeah. know? So you develop it to a certain point and then you sell it expensively yep. to some of the big shots. And so um, I do understand that mentality, but I don't think it's beneficial for craft beer on the long run. I I don't believe yeah. that that's possible because the the environment in which industrial beer production thrives is just so different and you need to take a close look at the numbers all the time and i think for for craft beer what is what makes it so outstanding is the variety so it's not easily replicable Uh, at at the same time it's also um you have this very small batches that you're making Mm -hmm. i mean unless you're sierra nevada but yeah (laughs) uh, but the but in general uh, speaking, so you are you're working under totally different conditions, and uh, the aim is not the what's the aim is not the bottom line. The aim is the quality in your bottle or in your keg, and that's 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 the real thing. Yeah. What we really loved was her campaign "Take Craft Back." We found it like yeah really funny and also inspiring and also kind of I wanted to have somebody who was a little bit bold in in her statements in the film and not, you know, not, not shy or so. And so I contacted her and said, you know, we've seen that campaign kicking off. We love it. 
um, we would love to feature that. And this is how, how we got uh, in, in touch with Julia and she committed early on. And then we were still developing the project further and trying to find protagonists. And then you realized for this beer, a love story, you needed a romantic lead, someone that everyone could instantly fall in love with. Uh, everyone's favorite character in this film, I think. I don't know if you guys agree on this, but your favorite, it's Peter Bocart, right? He's, yeah. the, he's the best. I you don't just about, instantly yeah. love him. You're not yeah. watching. You don't know how human beings work. Like for a love story, you need that romantic lead. He's exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so, and so we, we had started, you know, like some early day shooting just to cover some processes, like, uh, like the opening of the, of the carefree, uh, armed force at, at, at Stiegel's, uh, you know, Urbier stuff. And then I think, so this was in March, 2018. And in June, there was the first Brewers of Europe conference. So that's, that's a, a, a so in Europe, they're not trying because of the advent of craft beer also in Europe and, and to kind of give it a voice. What they want to get to is something like the CBC of Europe. Okay. And uh, the, the, the Brewers conference is something, uh, where, what the, the European, yeah, um, the Brewers of Europe conference, that's something, uh, that they try to, to get to that level. But I, I think it's going to take 10 years or so until that, that's going to work out that way as it already did in America or already does in America. But, um, the, uh, we went there and it, in the first evening, there was a dinner reception. So if you've ever been to Brussels, you have this magnificent, uh, Grand Place. So the main square, uh, with the old town hall beautiful building and inside there they were they were holding this uh dinner well it was not a dinner reception it was like a a drinks reception a, a beer reception actually uh in the evening and uh i went there to 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 shoot some b-roll as we say in film so basically to to get nice images atmospheric images and martin my um who's not only my co-producer but also my co-author on the film uh, he was trying to chat up people, you know, and say, and find people who would be interesting for the film to follow the next two days. The conference was the next two days. And, uh, at some point he introduced me and said, Hey, I found this guy, uh, Peter. He actually is Belgian, but he moved to in the nineties, he moved to America. And I think he, he could be interesting for us. So we started chatting with Peter and, and he was so funny. Yeah. He was really, he was so, he's, He's very, very smart, but he's also very, very funny. And so we fell in love with Peter and we said, oh, this guy must be in our film. <laughs> and then the next day, the conference was opening and the first keynote, you know, the opening keynote was by Steve Hindi from Brooklyn Brewery. And he was telling us his story, how he became, how he got uh, Brooklyn Brewery started. And we said, wow, what, what an amazing talk. What an amazing story. That's also something we need to feature in a film. So we asked Steve. And so we kind of came back uh, from that conference with having Steve and Peter on board. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, of course, it depends a lot uh, on, on, on the characters you have in a film. But the one thing that, that Peter Booker says early on in the film, that beer is my art, I totally subscribe to that. Totally. This is, this is exactly what craft beer is about. Yeah. yeah. I loved every way he described or was told to have described beers. Like he's like, Oh yeah, come look at this <laughs> designer. That's I'm making a beer based on the idea of this uh architect. Like that's what I'm thinking. It's like you're not thinking about the hops, you're not thinking about the yeast, you're not thinking about the malt. You're like, I just want it to be the beer representation of this building. And it's like I think one of my favorite lines was <laughs> that uh, a good beer only has three ingredients knowledge experience and creativity i was like man this guy uh is the best he's the best guy a true artist you know inspiration can come from anywhere yeah for his his medium yeah he's like oh i just found some leaks on the road i've never worked with leaks what if i worked with leaks that'd be fun oh it doesn't really work in the dry hop well let's try it somewhere else like just truly yeah just like find a media and try to make it something One of my favorite moments in the film is with Peter. It's it's near the beginning when 
he's talking and he's almost talking kind of conspiratorially like he's 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 bringing you into something and the shot is done with all the big barrels behind him and it's dark oh, and yeah. it almost looks like he's being led into a world like he's like follow me come with me you know yeah when he's in Rotenbach really, yes yes yeah, <laughs> yes so these are these are the photos at, at, at Rotenbach and uh and that that's an amazing place I mean yeah. uh, we've been to many amazing places but that's that's really that's that's my part. Yeah. You know, you see the history, you feel the history, and then the fun part was, you know, so basically, Rudy, the uh, yeah, he is, I think he's now the site manager at at, at Rodenbach. Uh, Peter and Rudy are long term friends. I think they went together in to brew school or something, and um, so they have all these fooders, but not every at, and Rodenbach basically also is a mix of you know like different fooders mm -hmm. to maintain the quality but they know which fooders render the better quality so they uh, went to actually do a little bit of tasting uh to to the one fooder that is kind of you know like outperforming all the others <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh we were I, I don't know if we were allowed to say which which fooder it was which right. number it was but it was uh and, and they, they were like super cons conspiratorial, you know, saying, yeah, yes, yeah, it's, still, it's still so <laughs> yeah. amazing. And, and, you know, like going back in time, like, I don't know, 30 years ago when, when Peter was working there. Yeah. I just love yeah. that he's like, I'll just steal this from you. I'm going to steal this beard from you. You know, you don't even appreciate it. You said it's okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, and, and then, I mean, that's something that we haven't in the film, but it's also funny. So, you know, they were a bit in a competition and a bit cocky <laughs> towards each other. And so, and so Peter came up, uh, do you actually know that there is a, that there is a yeast that they named after me that they found in the Amazonas in Brazil, <laughs> you know, in the, the rainforest and they named it after me. And it's like, um, I think it's a Pretonomyces yeast. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. So I mean, that is funny. something to brag about. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yes, absolutely. No, but it's, it was really, it was really fun. And I think, you know, once you, you know, something, because of course I wanted to, to see other stuff about beer and, and, um, but very often, um, if you have documentaries about beer, they're not taking beer serious. They're not taking it seriously and they're not, um, they're not taking it for full as well. So it's like, you know, yeah, it's, it's beer. Yeah. But if you compare that to wine documentaries and you see all the adoration and ad admiration that, that is brought towards, towards the great wines, um, I was missing that in a lot of the, you know, beer documentaries that I saw, at least those, those Europeans that I watched. And I thought, why is that? Because beer is the beverage of the common people and wine is the beverage of the elite. Could be, you know, that you have some sort of, uh, in, you know, built-in classism in that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I, I, for me, you know, after, after having this, this epiphany in America with craft beer, it, uh, for me, it was like, oh, wow. I mean, I, I had a similar epiphany in Burgundy, uh, like 20 years before, no, uh, well, yeah, 20 years before that. Um, with, with, with great wines, actually. Mm -hmm. And I had made, when I started out, out as a filmmaker, I was doing very small films. Uh, and I was working on a regional level in the north of Italy, uh, most no northern province in, of Italy, where, where there are the Dolomites. And I don't know if somebody's skiing, so where currently the, the uh, ski world championships are taking place. So in, in those <laughs> parts. And uh, the... And so I had some way of dealing with the beverage and the way it's being made and all the culture around it already mm -hmm. from, from those little uh, small films and little films that I've done like 15, 15 years ago. But then when it, when it came to beer and I had, and I had had this astonishing moment realizing, wow, beer actually is up to the same grandeur. Let's call it that way. Yeah. And to, to the same levels of quality and to the same complexity um, as really good wines. Um, for me, that 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 was a way where I said, you know, I I, I want to show my appreciation to that. 
and um, that's 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 my love that 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 went into the film and and also Martin's uh, because we both think that these you know brewers they are actually artists yeah and 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 we we really think that yeah, yeah. and to your point uh, with wine there's so many movies about it because wine really really wants you to know the history of wine, where it comes from, how long it's been around. This process doesn't change. This is a beautiful thing. It takes years to get your terroir right. And like, you know, the older, the better. Whereas beer really doesn't sell its history very well. It it really, with the craft beer movement, it became this thing like, this is a new, cool thing. And they, even though they have this tremendous history, they kind of don't talk about it. And in your film... Uh, you kind of go, hey, there is a history here that we should mention that leads to what we have here. And I think there's tons of breweries that do talk about that history, but it's they have to be prompted. And wineries will just tell you straight up, this, you know, this vineyard's been here for 250 years in the family. Like, the, beer doesn't have that story or doesn't get doesn't get told so readily. And I'm glad that you're able to actually do that with this documentary. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but uh, you know, I I I think one of the reasons for that may be that beer was like one of the first beverages that actually underwent the process of in, of industrialization and being a mass commodity um, that could be shipped all over the planet, and so that's one of the and and also to make it cheap, you know that 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 was was the other side, but making it cheap also meant. Uh, Killing the flavors and killing the distinctiveness of each individual beers, because you have got breweries um, that go back, you know, almost one thousand years, and uh, or at least you know seven hundred, eight hundred years uh, here in Austria. Like uh, you know, Hof, Hofstetten in Austria is one of the, I think it's the oldest brewery in Austria actually, and they go back like to the eleven hundreds. So that's pretty amazing. Then you know to have that continuity and, and that tradition but it's it's not much talked about actually and the the other thing is because you can brew everywhere i think you are lacking that usp you know this unique sales positioning where you can say you know you can make this wine only here and this is why it's special. Yeah. But actually, you can make an IPA everywhere, everywhere. And you can make a goza everywhere. And you can make, you know, a stout everywhere. And you can, you know, so there is there is no geographical, how to say, like, you know, this kind of uh, um, geographical, um, in, it, in Italian, it's uh, DOC, so denomination of Yeah, there's no classification origin. in beer for exactly. like, yeah. yeah. Like you're all exactly. getting your hops from the same place. Everybody's going to Yakima, like like you went to Yakima. Everybody's going there. Like the, people are trying to grow their own hops, but it's just not taken the same way. You're getting your malts from very similar areas. Whereas with wine, you are making it with the grapes that you have in your orchard, in, in your vineyard. So yeah, I mean, a lot of breweries are trying to get their ingredients as localized as possible, but the regions don't allow for it. Um, and wine very much is beautiful regional. Thing. Another beautiful thing is that beer leans into that. The beer is about, you know, DIY ethos. Like there, there's footage in the movie of two guys with home video footage making it on their stove in a kitchen. And it's like, yeah, we lean into that. We celebrate that about beer. Uh, at the end of the movie, when that Bombaclot wins that award, the most underdressed people in the place, no offense, <laughs> go up. they're the brewers, you know, yeah. wine wouldn't do that. There'd be pomp and circumstance at every level. And my first yeah. Food Society meeting was with, um, we had Charlie Bamforth speak, who, he was uh, Bass Brewing for a long time. He came to Sierra Nevada. He's been head of the Brewers Program at UC Davis. Um, they call him the Pope of Foam. So he's like really well known in the craft beer industry in the US. And he kind of went into, he just talked about whatever he wanted to. And it was very fascinating. <laughs> um, but he was going into, you know, people talk about wines, they'll spend so much money on it. But wine's made once a year like beer, you have to perfect it. You make it all year long. Like you don't have just one season and like you get a break the rest of the year. Like beer, you're constantly doing it, constantly perfecting, constantly innovating. So like people just don't take that into account. I, I mean, I worked in retail for alcohol for eight years and people are like, why is this beer so expensive? Or, why is this Belgian beer so much money? I'm like, well, there's a lot of history. Also, it's coming from another country. 
but like just all the work that goes into it, people aren't willing to pay a few extra dollars, but they'll pay more money for a wine that's been mass produced. So it's just kind of people don't make that connection with beer that they do with wine. Absolutely not. And um, I think, you know, yeah, so this was really at this conference in Brussels that, that we were attending where they were kind of lamenting about the that uh, beer couldn't hold up with wine or, or spirits uh, when it came to the lobbying power because mm -hmm. uh, nobody was associating all the labor and, 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 and also, you know, dedication that was going into beer um, that they were doing poor whiskies or that what they or, or you know or cognacs or whatever and and um, and and of course for wine and one of the demands that came out of that panel session was we need more stories we need more stories about beer to be tall and uh and martin and i said yeah because that's exactly <laughs> what we are doing or what what we are what we are going to do at that stage of the film and we said that's and that's entirely the point and i think you know um if you have you know like if you if you think about um you know brewdog uh from scotland yes and the kind of i mean it's an enormous success story yeah um the beers are solid but the marketing is, is incredible mind -boggling. <laughs> so the marketing is unrivaled yeah the way they're financing themselves with these kind of shares that, that they are handing out is also super smart. And and then they're doing a lot of crazy things. Yeah, always pushing the envelope. But do I really want to be stay in a hotel where I can have a beer shower? Is this how we <laughs> yes. how we value um, the beverage and the work and the technology and the creativity and you know all that has, has gone into? I don't think so. You know, I, I, at least for me, it's that's not. The thing is that the that we need stories, but we need different stories. We, I think, we need different stories from the Brewdog stories, and we need, uh, I think, a different branding of craft beer, not being the stuff that some, that some crazies are doing. Yeah, this is serious stuff being done by serious people in a serious way, and the outcome can hold up. To the best that you have in winemaking, yeah, and and I and so I think maybe our film is like a first step into that direction. I I, I hope it is just a first step, and I don't hope and I, I hope it's not you know evaporate like the drop you know on a on a hot stone, but but that it's here to stay and create a stream and then put on a a real flow of of films taking. The entire craft beer sector seriously and uh, telling telling interesting stories and fascinating stories because there are so many yeah, there are really so many and uh, what I really found interesting is how many people in craft are not trained brewers even in Europe yeah you know? I think for America you would expect it because America is just so much just hands on. You know, if you want to do it you do it uh, in Europe it's more kind of you know, it goes to the educational system, schooling system, and, mm -hmm. and uh, also professional schooling, especially in the German-speaking countries. And so, like, uh, you can call yourself a brewer once you've learned brewing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and what what is happening through craft beer is it's challenging this outdated mode, I think, you know. And, it's, and you have so many people with fascinating stories where they come from and what they did before, before they turned to brewing. And I, I think with Steve Hindi, we have got a fascinating story yes. right there. You know, being being a war reporter yeah. for that. Barley and me very much came from the idea: of these brewers have stories to tell. Let's let them tell them. So, talking about their beer, let's talk about them. Um, and in the wine world, you don't really know the vintner at all. When you're at a brewery, you meet the brewer. They're always there's one around at all times. And in a winery, you don't have that experience. You've got your maitre d', you've got, you know, your wine expert, but you never meet the person who's making this wine. It just doesn't happen. So it's and, very and different. Also, right. And also the winemaking process, you know, that's the other thing, you know, what about transparency? So what goes actually into the cask? Yeah. Yeah? Very Egg white. Much. Never seen that in a wine documentary. Yeah. Well, they don't want to be like, well, you know? we, we've owned this land for 200 years and it cost nothing back then and we're just making profit, pure profit off yeah. this <laughs> nonstop. <Yeah. laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I still love good wine, so that, right. that's that's not the point. But I think it's because it's very often compared. I think when it comes to transparency, and also, you know, it's not the story that sells the beer; it's actually the quality of the beer that sells the beer in craft beer, and that's cool. You know, yeah, you you, you buy a very specific beer because you wanna have that sensation of what's in it. Yeah, you and and you really see that, and you really see. Beer, a love story, the, the, the love of the two Americans who are just, they met over drinking beer, sharing a beer. They ventured to a new land together just to try new beers with new people. It's a love story, not just of the brewers, but also of the uh, people enjoying it and will go to far lengths to, to sample the beer. Even Kurt, the, the guy who, who has to run down that cavern into the basement, crawling over casks and crates to grab a bottle of 1968 the joy in his face when he holds up that beer that you could still drink and, he, yeah. and he's such pride in telling you you could still drink this yeah even though it's, it's 45 it's years old love story yeah <laughs> and uh you know i, I mean the, these would have been also a great story so these two guys from california they they were actually traveling europe trying to trade beers <laughs> so so they 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 brought over some <laughs> rare beers or very very special beers from the u.s to trade them against european beers yeah that are very hard to get in the u.s and so i i find i mean following a them has been a story on its own yeah because i'd imagine the also, beer trading world's very different in europe than in america because <clears> we're <throat> so intent on like what's new and hot and like have you had this crazy thing that's happening and in europe like we just enjoy a good beer can you just have a good beer <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but also i think you know the i think just if you think about the process you know so i think the day after they were going to cantillon oh yeah, yeah. and yeah. uh and then uh certainly to other like known belgian brewers i'm sure they went to like west water because that's like we don't get that here you know that's like one of the it's, really rare yeah cool that, beers. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and I think Brasserie de la Seine, uh, then three or four, but I don't re remember all of them. Yeah. But it, it was just really interesting to see that. And, and, uh, I mean, this, this, this on it, on its own could be just another film. Yeah. But then, of course, I mean, this film is just showing part of Europe and part of America also because we had, I mean, it's just 90 minutes could have been much longer, I guess. Yeah. Um, but when you think about the most exciting country in Europe for brewing currently is Italy. Yeah. And that's totally unknown to anybody because Italian beer is still associated with the, you know, usual Moretti or so it's not, but on, on the other hand, it's also, it doesn't surprise me because they have got a, a, a very great tradition of, of making great wines. Yeah. And so it's that knowledge and that dedication moves over to a, to that beverage, the entire experience that they are bringing with them certainly relates to make exceptional beers. The country with the highest number of breweries per capita is Switzerland. Really? Uh, because the Swiss market is so heavily dominated, uh, by Carlsberg or oh, by the Carls, Carlsberg owned brands. I think they have a market domination of something like 80% or more. <laughs> So you have all these microbreweries popping up all over. So they have a population of, I don't know, 8 million or so, 7 million inhabitants and 1,000 breweries. Yeah. That's, so that's, that's, nuts. that's a lot. And, uh, I had some of the most exciting beers. I mean, I've got something <laughs> <laughs> Uh, these are these are bottles. <laughs> so I'm I'm in my office, and from time to time we do some beer tasting, also while working on other films. So that's that's a that's a BFM Brasserie de Franche Montagne from Switzerland, and um, that's a Abbé de Saint Bon Chien, uh, which is an an amazing beer that I had some time ago. Just a I've got, so that's a really nice one. That's a Goose from uh, oh, Bonn, yeah. the black, black label, which was also cool. So something that, that, uh, Frank Bonn is doing now, or actually his son who has taken over the brewery, Carol. So, uh, what they are doing is 
they are making uh, cask types. So uh, uh, they have the mash that goes into different fooders. Mm -hmm. And because each fooder has got its own uh, microbiome, let's call it that, you get very different beers out of of the same mash. Mm -hmm. And so he's doing like fooder types beer. So he he calls it VAT, so V-A-T, which is Flemish for, for... barrel and so or or cask and and so that's very exciting that i find um that you go away from trying to get this harmonized blend and going into the you know more how to say um into into an an area which is much more individual and not replicable well is this part (laughs) right yeah (laughs) Very difficult yeah. to, to replicate it, yeah, for sure. Uh, to, to to actually remake that, yeah. And so I I think that's something that's exciting, yeah. That's really exciting, and I think that's the way to go. Yeah. Uh, Corky, what were your thoughts, takeaways from this film, Beer: A Love Story? I did. I had one question for Fritz. Please do. Um, you've mentioned a couple times uh, Chris's epiphanies. And then in that moment in the film, when he's discussing that, you have him in these moments where he's looking at the grandeur of the Colorado landscape and he's, he's surrounded by this awe inspiring. Is that something you, you think of ahead of time that you're going to marry that image to that, that interview, or is that something you find in editing that just works really well? When I shot it, I knew that I would certainly use it uh, in the film. And it is because I mean, we talked ahead of our travel to the U.S. We talked about what what was the most impressive, you know, experiences that you had. And I think for us Europeans from Central Europe, which is very heavily pop, uh, densely populated and which is like a huge garden, wilderness and the rawness of of nature are something that 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 we don't know. So we are totally fascinated by that, and I I knew that. I would have as seen with him just being fascinated and, and, and struck by, by the, by this amazing nature, this amazing American nature and wilderness. So the, that it then became that I linked it up with exactly that story of his was at the really late stage, um, at, of the editing process because his story, his epiphany story was very through a long time linked to where he was uh, going in the forest uh, next to, next to his, his house um, and brewery, which is basically a farmhouse in a small village. So he he was going up to the forest and plucking uh, truce sprouts um, to use that instead of hops uh, to, to bitter a beer that, that he was, that he was making. Which he calls Truce Willis. <laughs> so instead of Bruce Willis, it's Truce Willis. I think. <laughs> no, or, or, no, Spruce, Spruce, Spruce oh, Willis. Spruce Willis. <laughs> Spruce Willis. And, um, I haven't tasted that yet, but, uh, he does it like once a year. And, um, and this was actually the, the, the scene that I had in mind. But then we had this fantastic story from La Cabra Brewing in Pennsylvania, where they were telling the story of somebody kind of, you know, brewing, you know, putting an entire Christmas tree, yeah. a Douglas fir tree yeah. into the, into the brew, <laughs> brewing pot, into the mash. I, I was like, okay, we can't have the same story twice. Yeah. So I let go of, of the other one and used those, those uh, nature images. But, you know, in the process, the process of doing a, and a creative documentary. So this is a creative document. There are documentaries that are scripted. You know, if you do a history documentary, mm-hmm. you know exactly what you're going to film because you have the story there up front. But if you are doing a creative documentary where you are following people and then trying to put everything together so that it makes sense, um, the film really is made on the timeline in the editing process. So you have your ideas, you have your stories, but you don't know exactly up front which kind of images go best with which kind of stories yeah and so i think it was a so, really yeah indelible that's, that's something 
evocative moment. I think it was really captured well and, and put together well. And if that beer is anything like Bruce Willis, it will just get more bitter and sour as it ages. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> no, no, no offense to Bruce Willis, but yeah. actually, you know what, Bruce Willis, if you want to come on the podcast and talk to me about it, we can do that. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, the I love to work on uh, on on several layers uh, at the same time in a film when I'm telling a story. So there is a story that is being told. Then there is the setting, the backdrop, uh, visually, which I used, and uh, then there is also the action in that setting. And what I try to do very often is to tell through these, through what's happening on screen and through what's told underneath, uh, use what's happening on screen in a metaphorical way. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, enhances the engagement of the, of the viewer because your um, because you're triggered to try to make sense of the connection between the two constantly. Of, of, of course, you can't overstretch this. You know, it can't be just totally far out. But for me, that's, 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 a, that's a way to, to make it more interesting and also more beautiful at the same time. Any further questions, Corky? And I, and I, lastly, the, I really appreciated that you, you captured the convivial, the celebratory nature of people gathering together, having beers without drifting into the obnoxious, um, you know, cliched beer drinker, beer swiller. You had people close talking like they do often after they've had a couple, <laughs> but, it, but it's not that, you know, as I say, stereotypical obnoxious frat bro, as we would say in America, it's not that. Uh, it's it it is it's something worthy of respect and admiration, and it's on the level of the seriousness of wine drinking, of any serious industry. Uh, yeah. I think you really captured that very well. Thank you. We also had a long thought, you know, of going to Munich to the to the Oktoberfest, but then we said, is this the kind of beer culture that we are actually describing? Yeah. And we said, no, it's not. Um, and I think what was, and also we, I, I. I I mean, Chris goes there every year because he's just living like one hour from Munich yeah. or, or an hour and 15 minutes. So for him, that's like he's hopping on the train, he's getting going there, he's having some fun with his pals and his family, and then he goes back. But um, the if we wanted to really have a portrayal of a beer festival, you got the, it. the way that it's new and interesting, uh, he said up front, he said, you know, there are like, the one thing that well, you really have to go to is arrogant sour. Yeah. Because it's absolutely not about marketing. So you have this huge line of taps. They're all the same taps. You don't see which kind of cakes are underneath. They've all got the same sign on the tap. And you're just tasting beer, you know, glass after glass after glass. And that's it. And so that's and and that's the philosophy. This is not a marketing competition. This is a competition of taste. Yeah. And just that. And flavors. And just that. A truly and I love beer idea. festival. That's, yeah, super fun. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I, I will say, having done, like, sour tastings at places, nothing will mess you up more than, like, eight low ABV, high alkalinity <laughs> sours. I, I have drunk like eight ounces of beer that were no bigger than 6% and blacked out because they just, all those like yeast mixing around, all all those wild critters crawling just ruin you. <laughs> and so I was like, I was like watching like, that looks fun. And then I remembered what happens when I do that myself. And I'm like, that looks terrible, but I get it. <laughs> um yeah, so we kind of managed to to keep the balance, <laughs> and, and 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 Herbert, my my sound guy, and I, uh, what we did is we we had each of us had a can of a cheap Austrian lager okay. to sort of detox okay. after the, after all the sour beers. Yeah. Um. Also, no, 
this was actually more, you know, the, I mean, we called it, we called it detoxing, but it wasn't really detoxing. It was more to kind of restore your palate. You know, it's kind of, mm-hmm. it's like a reset of your palate. Yeah. Uh, because with sour beers, you go really down very funky ways. Yes. And that's, <laughs> that's something that, you know, you kind of need to get back to normal at some point. Yeah. yeah, they're called wild it's, hails it's, it's, because it's, you never know what you're going to get. It's wildly different from one to the next. You're like, oh yeah, this one's like a light true. tart cranberry, and this one's like barrel heavy, <laughs> like heavy fruits, like red fruits, just craziness. That's like nine percent. It's there's no way to know what you're going to get until you get it, and it's yeah. lovely. What What was also really fun to do uh, uh, was filming with Julia Hertz. Um, at the patio of her of her house, mm-hmm. actually, you know, in her backyard, with the chickens and the, the dog, uh, and we started at, I think we started at dawn. Yeah, really, like Pretty I don't know, five a, five a.m. or six a.m. something like this, or between five and six a.m. Yeah, six, yeah, must be that time of the day. And then they were brewing, and uh, in between we were, you know, trying some beers, and yeah, it got funny. Yeah, we're like, hey, should we, should we throw these choke cherries in here? Why not? Let's, they're, they're right yeah. here. They, fits the flavor profile. That, it seems so much like a home brewer move to do. Like, what's around here that we can kind of spice this up with? Yeah, but, you know, but home, home brewing, like, a, kind kind of a cool level already, you know, of home brewing. So, um, uh, but but we, we wanted to have that in there as well. And so the question was, do we go... So, I mean, that's always a challenge with the characters in a film so basically um the more people you have in the film the harder it is to relate to them personally mm-hmm. and uh what you want to create as a filmmaker is a personal relationship of the viewer with 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 the people that you're portraying so we try to kind of we try to allocate as many tasks as possible to our main cast Mm-hmm. And and then they would be on the journey and uh, encountering all the other people. Yeah. So this was this was one of the ideas. But of course, I mean, what was fascinating for me was um, going to Yakima Valley from Seattle. So we were going past. Uh, I think it was, must have been Mount Rainier, and then um, so you go over over that ridge, and then and then you go down, and uh, within one hour driving, you are from a northern rainforest in the desert and yeah. that's 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 unbelievable and then another half an hour drive and you have all these plantations showing up uh along the yakima river you know and so you have hops but you have also wine and fruits and and you know it's this this was really fascinating for me and Peter kind of talks about that when he travels from Maine to Colorado. He's like, yeah, we went through all this really boring terrain, kind of flat, which coming from the Midwest, I, I am fully aware it's a very boring terrain. You can see for miles. It's not interesting. Then you hit those mountains. You're like, oh, that's what we're talking about. Like, it, And it's just so much more fertile. Everything's just different, like immediately. It's just a quick turnaround on that. Um, so I think you capture that twice in the movie. I love I love the journey for Chris uh, to go find that Yakima gold because he was early in the film. You, he mentions that he was having trouble with ingredient supply uh, yes. as a small brewer. And I'm like, I know in my time in the industry or around the industry that like that's a common problem. And he kind of throws it away as a throwaway line early in the film, and then you circle back to it as like a bigger point about these larger breweries buying up supplies and making it very difficult for the smaller breweries to get those quality of ingredients they need. So I was like, oh, that's great. I love that they did bring it back because I was worried that you were going to miss that point. And then it comes in. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. This guy gets it. This guy understands what brewers are going through to get their glass on a table. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, we could have probably we could have expanded a bit more on those kind of power games, uh, power games that are being played there. Because you need an But then on the other hand, we said, no, we need to stay in with, with the focus that we chose. Yeah. And the focus is, is for the appreciation. It's not about... And also, there are other films around, like Beer Wars, which is yeah. a good film about the you know struggle between big and small. But I, but I think the the the, the aim of our film just was a was a different one. And so we touch a little bit upon it uh, towards the ending of the film. Yes, but not too heavy. 
we would have had more material, but then I think it would have gone, you know, into a different direction. Yeah. So what what did you do before before setting up, or what 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 are you doing in your jobs uh, except doing the podcast? But I kind of fell into the beer podcast thing because I I love beer. I do stand up comedy, and people are like, you should do funny beer stuff. I'm like, well, beer's not funny. Beer's very serious. It's got a lot of stories to it. It's very interesting people. I know a lot of those people and I know people listen to podcasts. So I was like, maybe I'll just turn it into a beer podcast, which was initially a plan to accelerate my comedy stuff. And very much now is entirely separated from it. It has almost <laughs> no com. Well, it does because like people are fun to interact with yeah. um, and, and the comedy comes naturally, but it's not any kind any kind of force. I used to like promote my shows. I'm like, I got a show coming up here and here. And I'm like, I don't, nobody, nobody cares. Nobody needs to know. It's fine. <laughs> But uh, mm-hmm. but that's, what, what about everybody else? What are, what, what are you guys up to, Corky? What are you up to, Paulina? Uh, I'm in architecture. <laughs> uh, I also do comedy. And since the uh, pandemic and everything like that, I've started some furniture restoration on the side. So I'm not oriented in beer in any way except for an absolute love of drinking the product uh, and exploring. Uh, without, I mean, these two, you'll you'll make a reference. And these two will nod their heads up and down like this. And I'll be like, wait, what are we talking about here? <laughs> I have to catch up. But uh, my love for the for the product and, um, and just for the nature of it, I think especially, again, with the pandemic, I miss just talking about beer with people. So that's why I, I, I love doing this podcast so much with Ben and Paulina. Um, oh, thank you. So sweet. Nice. Have wonderful discussions with people like yourself. I've been in the alcohol industry for a little over eight years now. Um, so I started with um, the largest alcohol retailer in the country um, and I got it. I, I applied because I liked beer and then that kind of just beer was all I wanted. Like it, <laughs> our store was mostly like wine because it's called it was called Total Wine. But beer was part of it. Um, so I ended up like teaching the beer classes and they let us do the Cicerone certified beer server exam. So I'd always like help everyone study for it. Um, now I work for an alcohol uh, distributor, but I'm also... Outside of work, I'm uh, the chapter leader for the Sacramento chapter of Pink Boots Society. I don't know if you've heard of it. Not really. But yeah, oh. so it's a nonprofit organization. Um, it first started as women in the beer industry. They've now opened it up to um, other fermentables. So every year we have brew days. So we go, we team up with local breweries and um, we make beer with them. And that's how we raise funds for our chapters. We do um, scholarships. We've had someone in our chapter go to Belgium yeah. and brew with women in Belgium. And then we've had someone go to Yakima for hop school. We've had, there's all kinds of different scholarships that are really cool. Um, so it's really fun. We have educational meetings. Uh, we just talk about beer and drink beer together and just really cool for like women in different parts. We have a, a lawyer. We have a lot of people in sales. We have women brewers. So we all have different aspects and meet up and it's really fun. That's great. That's great. I mean, because the, the, this was also one, one of the problems that we were struggling with when we were making the film is to actually find breweries where, um, well, breweries, actually, actually to find a female, let's say, lead, lead pro, leading protagonists. And we were super happy to have Anne-Francoise Piper yeah. from, from Orval in, in our film. And I think Orval actually, because they they don't do advertisement because mm-hmm. it sells so well. Yeah. Also because it's a fantastic beer. <laughs> and so and so um they said, you know, we don't see any we don't see any need for us to be in that film. Uh, we we don't see any benefit because we don't do advertisement. So um and then we said, Yeah, but what you have is you have got a female brewmaster and we would love to feature her. And then, and then they they agreed to be in the film, which I which I think is is fantastic. Also, because I think Anne Francoise is a really nice is a really nice woman, and and she is and she's making one of the greatest beers there are, in my opinion. I mean, for me, there are like some beers that I can drink all the time, and then there are others that I that I need to be in a specific mood to drink them. But Orval is one of those beers that I can drink at whatever time, not whatever yeah. time of the day, obviously, but like in whatever mood I am. And so it's it's one of my favorites, favorite beers, really. 
Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's really important. I mean, Orval has such a history. It's not a new brewery. They're not, you know, they they're known for their beer. So for them to have a woman running it, like I think a lot of people I mean, some people in the beer industry, some people outside that tend to think like women don't like beer or aren't interested or don't know how to brew beer. Like it's a men's thing. But I think it was really interesting that something so historical and so well known, like there's a woman behind this. Mm -hmm. so that's awesome. Yeah, I did not yeah. know that. And that was great. I also, uh, as a testament to how beer has changed, she's like, when I first had uh, interviewed, I never had a Norval. And she's like, it was so hoppy and i would never use hoppy as a way to define orval even though because the beer language and the way beer has been presented since then has changed so much like hops were a mutant thing that people kind of like you put them in there because they need to be there for preservation to now being a very major focus of most beers so even hearing that i was like this is crazy that this used to be considered a hoppy beer uh yeah but you know the uh... The other day, I was I was having an Orval, and I was drinking a little bit more aware just just yeah. of that sentence. And there is a hoppiness, but it's very very back in the. So if you have like the range of of flavors mm -hmm. that are there, it's not up on the top. It's very down there, but it is there. And you have this hoppy structure that you would have like tannins in a in a in a yeah in a, in a wine. rich wine, yeah. actually in a heavy wine. So you, it is there, but it's not dominant it's not yeah because of course uh you know with the with the bread in there you have the flavors of sour that come into play and but it's uh yeah i mean it's in terms of complexity and structure it's an amazing beer it's an yeah, amazing beer. Truly. i also really and, appreciated the the shot of the interview with her because there's another woman behind her and she doesn't get a word in but it's just a subliminal reinforcement a visual reinforcement of there's not just me I got backup. There's there's more women with me, you know, and uh, almost like another generation's got, coming along. So it was really nice to see. Yeah, hopefully, actually, you know, I mean, if you if you think about the the history of beer, especially, you know, in what I can say about Europe and you know Scandinavia, which uh, it was not the Vikings brewing, it was the wives brewing mm -hmm. for a long, long, long time. And I think the same also was true in the German speaking countries where brewing was not this kind of male, um, domain that much. It, I, I, I think, I think there's probably something that came with the process of industrialization, you know, because you had like these huge machines coming in and, and then it was more like of a, of a, more of a, of a labor issue in terms of, you know, having physical strength. But um, but I, I'm happy to see that that this is going back. And also the other thing is what really differs, uh, what re really differ differentiates um, industrial beer or like the traditional pilsner lager world from from craft beer is if you go to a craft beer pub, like half of the people there are female, mm -hmm. and that's good because this means after some time maybe it needs another. 10 years, maybe half of the brewers will be females because that's the way it's, you know, it's being, it's, it's becoming natural. And uh, once you have had that sensation of, of consuming those beers, you may be also drawn towards, towards brewing the beers. And in a way it's not so different from, you know, other activities like cooking or uh, fermenting food, you know, it's it's actually very close it's just neighboring and so so i i really do hope because i think it will it will bring um new nuances uh i think also to the to the flavors that that we are going to experience in the future and the same also goes looking at at other continents like south america and africa and asia so these are all continents with who are very heavy on flavors and spices and and uh the, you know the taste itself is just i would say much more intense than the one that derives from from the european cuisine so i think the and also from the like more newer american cuisine so i think the the kind of beers that we are going to experience in the future uh 
is they are becoming, I think they are going to become even more mind blowing than what we are seeing already today. And so I'm really looking forward to this happening, you know, having more women, having more diversity uh, from more regions in the world. And also what you can brew or can't brew, there's basically nothing that you can't brew, you know. So I, I'm looking forward to experiencing all this new stuff that's coming up in the future. And hopefully that I will see and not just my son. Yeah. <laughs> And then hopefully there's a beer two electric boogaloo, but I would, of course, I would call it beer two unopened fermentation relationship. Uh, <laughs> we kind of <laughs> explore <laughs> yeah. uh, all the different things that are happening. Uh, that's just the thing I thought in my head, and I'm like, I'm going to say it because I have to. I thought of it. It has to be out in there. Paulina, what were your reactions to watching this movie as you were watching it? What were the feelings you were feeling? Yeah, I mean, I... Being stuck at home, uh, it, you know, really made me miss like having beer with people, like seeing the beer fest, traveling. Like I, I don't travel that much. I'm, I don't have money to go across the country and whatever. But, you know, when I go to a new city, I want to try whatever beer is local. And so like Belgium's always been somewhere I want to go eventually one of these days when, you know, we're, we're not infected. So like just seeing, you know, the breweries from the inside was really, so it was almost like traveling from home. And I think it really captured like the social aspect for me. Beer is very social. Like I've, there's so many people I've met just for beer, like, Mm -hmm. like Ben, you know, I, there's so many people like I would never have met if I didn't go to a brew fest or a tap room and, or I know someone else they know. And I think like Julia hers, she was like, you always have friends if you go to the brew pubs, which is so true. You know, like I, there's so many people but I, I wouldn't know today if I wasn't in, as interested and passionate about beer as I am. And so I think you really captured that. And I thought that was amazing. Thank you. But it's true also, you know, I mean, yeah. this, this, this was a film because usually you always run into some sort of troubles because you can sort of foresee something, but you can't, you know, foresee and sort of hedge everything that that's going to come around while making a film. And usually it's a process that takes about, you know, two years to three years or so. So this was the one film during the production of which I only met, really only met nice people. Yeah, and this that, was amazing because that never happens in real life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, and, that's, and so that, that this is really something that was unique about that film. And also, of course, it was lots of fun. Yeah, It was so much fun making it. Yeah, that's the one thing about uh, the beer industry is, by and large, some of the nicest, most intelligent, most caring people you can come across. There's a few people who aren't, but it's it's so <laughs> rare that it's like, how do you not want to be a part of this? You know, um, so I, I want to thank you for, first of all, giving us your time to talk about this. And second, for showing the world that that's the reality of the beer world, because as we discussed about with the wine industry, they're very aloof. They're kind of separate from their constituency and beer is very involved in their constituency, which they understand means it's everybody. Everybody drinks beer. They may not drink the same beers, but everybody drinks beer. It's a wonderful industry is my point. I'm glad you focused on it. Thank you so much for your time. But before we go, Fritz, where can people find this film? Is I know uh, it's with Untapped through February 28th. What are the plans for um, major distribution and things like that? So you can you can always find the, the film on beermovie.org. So that's like, that's the homepage of the film. This is where you can always find it. What we do is until the end of February, we are working with Untap, but then we will have more and and not exclusive partners, but we call them premium partners through whom we want to distribute the film. I don't think that we will try to go on one of the bigger platforms soon maybe a year two years until 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 we will be on amazon or somewhere and the reason for that is because we think that we we want to start a conversation Mm -hmm. and we want to be in touch with the people who watch the film we don't want to have these instances of anonymizing the be it the audience or be it the filmmakers we want to be in touch with people so that's 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 one of the main reasons the other is you know there's a lot of uh films on amazon and and itunes but there's not so many films on untapped or yeah. you know whoever comes next so that's the so this is this is really also it's a way of of finding 
new channels of distribution for the film industry uh, during a time when the film industry become very concentrated. And you have, you have the same market concentrations that you have elsewhere. So that's also a way of, you know, really linking up with, with a pre-existent niche audience, but a niche audience that's global. And this is our, that, that's, that's really our goal, uh, with this release strategy from the film. And, and we had some consultants that we were working with, even when we were uh, still shooting for the film, um, uh, from some, uh, paradigm consulting they're based in LA and uh and and they told and they are like the experts on indie distribution and we said you know we have made this indie film and we would love to have an indie distribution and the first thing they told us is um don't try to bring the crowd to the film try to bring the film to the crowd and I think so this partnership with Untapped, which I think is a really great opportunity for the film to get you know get no being known uh, in the first place and, and find its market quickly and find, and find its market quickly. Uh, that's, that's, that's really something that we were aiming at, uh, even during the production. And, uh, if this, go, if this works out well, it can easily be a model for me and also for Martin for the release strategy for other things that we are doing, uh, you know, trying to find your niche audience that is already pre-existent and then start with them as the peer group for the for, for for your product to to watch it and also to work up with them because in the end you know i mean was this an interview was this was this for work i think we spent a, a lovely one hour and a half here <laughs> so. thanks for it yeah and uh your distribution model how very craft of you to really focus <laughs> on those locals and get them what they need so if people want to find out more not just about beer or love story, but about you and what you're working on. Where can they find you, Fritz? Well, other films of mine are on Amazon. So other films of mine are on Amazon and on iTunes. I had one film on Netflix. Maybe maybe there's coming more. But uh, uh, generally speaking, if they want to hook up with me, they can do it through the webpage, uh, beermovie.org. I think that's the easiest. So you've got the film there and the ways to to buy it or rent it. And um, and also my contact, just write me write me an email from there, and I usually respond within a day. You know, keeping in mind the time difference, which yeah. is like nine hours between California and Europe. Yeah. So <laughs> don't expect an immediate reply, uh, reply if you write me in, if you're evening because that's really in the middle of my night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want. Thank you again for putting uh, all your time towards us. I really appreciate it. Uh, Corky, before we go, what are you up to? What, any final thoughts you want to share with the group? I just want to thank Fritz for his time uh, and his, for his effort on this movie uh, and sharing it with us. Uh, it was a wonderful watch. Um, and I wish you luck in your endeavors, and I hope this model works out for you and is successful for you. Um, thank you. That, uh, I'm just, you can find me on Dare Daniel Podcast, reviewing bad movies. Um, <laughs> No shows to promote yet. Maybe soon. Yeah, coming closer. Uh, check out the Sack Comedy Spot. Corky's <laughs> home away from home back in the day. <laughs> and Paulina, where can people find you? What are you? Any final thoughts? Anything like that? I loved just being able to travel vicariously through the film, um, you know, while being home all day long. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. I think everything, all the shots are beautiful. I mean, it just, I think it made beer really approachable to people who don't know much about it it didn't go into too much of the technical aspects so i think like corky had mentioned when we first discussed it like you know people who don't who casually drink beer can appreciate it it's not something just for beer nerds so i think you did a really good job making it approachable enjoyable um it's just a it's a fantastic documentary i think it was great um i, I loved it <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, and then uh, I for Pink Boots, we've got Brew Days happening already. Uh, we're gonna have some beer releases for next month. So you can find us. Uh, I think it's uh, I forget our Instagram already. I believe it's Pink Boots Sacramento. It Maybe is Pink, Pink Boots Sacramento. Sacramento. It's a long one. Pink Boots Sacramento. Um, we will be announcing the Brew Days coming up. The release is coming up. International Women's Day is coming up, March eighth. Mark your calendars. Um, we have two Brew Days scheduled that day, so that's awesome. And then you can find me uh, on Instagram, Ola Paulina. Um, I'm usually just drinking beer or doing something silly. (laughs) 
And uh, for Barley Me Pod, me, Ben Rice, uh, you can find me across social media at Barley Me Pod. Uh, my final thoughts on this film, same. Loved it. I enjoyed the walk through history, the way that you easily tied in the current market problems and the characters. Uh, and uh, it, it, I, I fell in love. I'm I'm uh, in a happy relationship, but uh, Peter Bocart uh, stole my heart. <laughs> and I want more of him in everything. Just Hollywood, find him, put him in things. Just, I don't know if he's an actor, but I feel like he just naturally would, would do it. Uh, so that was uh, great. Again, find Barley Me across all social media, Barley Me Pod. Check out my chugs for charity, raising money for social justice, for, you know, uh, service industry workers affected by the COVID-19 crisis. And, uh, you know, just since we're here, a new basketball and beer podcast, please dunk responsibly. The listens are terrible. Please listen to the podcast. It's very fun. It's me and Phil Webster, a local chef about town, talking about old school and current basketball events while comparing players to beers, teams to breweries, and uh, styles to eras of basketball. It's great. Uh, I, I love it. And the, the response response has been if you get double digit listens you're lucky um, <laughs> and i've also started producing and engineering without you don't have to hear my voice at all i get it there's a lot of me you don't have to do it there's a new podcast i'm working on just recording uh called it's crazy you're in my business with tavi and becky lynn two comedians answering listener questions mostly about mental health and like uh things like that and it's a half hour breeze of a listen they're so good together check that out I think that's that's all my promos, right? I hate doing it, and there's probably more, and I don't care. Moving on. Fritz, I want to thank you so much for your time talking about this. Uh, for the listeners, go check this movie out. Well, it's like eight bucks on Untapped right now. It's masterfully filmed. The storyline's good. Uh, and this, I mean, this interview, also great. Thank you for listening to that. Fritz, thank you so much uh, for appearing on Barley Me Presents, uh, Leonard Malting. And uh, Corky McDonald, thank you so much again for being one of my masterful co-hosts. And Paulina Olivares, the best around. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's yeah. it. Any final thoughts we need to get out there? For me, oh, I, I, I'm just very grateful that um, for, for you to, to have me on your show. And uh, thank you so much, Paulina, Corky, and Ben. And let's see if we wind up talking about a sequel or so at some yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so so much longer to going to California again, but uh, yeah, let's see when we can travel again. Yeah. Yes. Hey, thank you so much. I'm off now. Thanks bye bye. Much. Take care. Thank you. Stay safe. You too. Cheers. <laughs>